So there are a few uh, predictors or risk factors for extubation failure. So a baby who has been on prolonged sedation, you should wean the sedation adequately, allow, make sure that the baby is not having withdrawal signs of opioid withdrawal. For example, if they're irritable, they are more likely to uh, fail the non-invasive ventilation. Uh, multiple intubation efforts might mean there is airway edema, so you may need to consider peri-extubation steroids. Difficult or traumatic intubation, you need to think twice. Uh, before you extubate, in case a baby fails, the next intubation episode may be difficult, so do it in the morning, make sure there is adequate support. Uh, units should try to get video laryngoscopes, which make it more easy if you have a difficult intubation as well. If a baby has a neurologic or neuromuscular disorder, they are at risk of type 2 respiratory failure. They are unlikely to manage well with non-invasive ventilation, so again, uh, it's a risk of extubation failure for obvious reasons. Underlying genetic conditions uh, for similar reasons. Airway abnormalities may make it difficult for the baby to cope with the non-invasive ventilation. This might also in include babies with a cleft palate where uh, cleft lip and palate where securing the non-invasive ventilation may be an issue. Uh, positive fluid balance might indicate that the baby has a stiff chest wall and uh, this makes it uh, more difficult for a baby to manage once extubated. So you may need to account for that. If there is significant acidosis, same as uh, needing inotropic support and hemodynamic instability, it means the overall condition of the baby is not stable, so you can delay the extubation and sepsis and NEC we discussed earlier. Uh, in a premature baby, obviously the lower the gestational age, especially the baby is below 26 weeks, uh, the risk of uh, failing extubation, the resulting atelectrotrauma, most of the extubated babies you might note that they need more support once they get reintubated if they fail. And this is because of that electrotrauma. The lung collapses, uh, it's stiff, and you need to open up the lung again. So uh, you may even need high-frequency ventilation to open up, and this stress is going to increase the risk of BPD for these babies. And that's why we saw the previous outcome. The babies who fail extubation have a poorer outcome in general. Uh, a lower postmenstrual age, the earlier you extubate, the higher the chance of failure. Uh, but that doesn't mean in the bigger babies you hold off extubation, you still aim to actively extubate these babies when they are ready. But in the tiniest babies where the risk of failure is more than 50%, as we will see later on, you need to be more careful. Uh, in terms of a low current weight, male gender, as always, is a risk. Intraventricular hemorrhage grade 3 or 4 because it might impact the neurological uh, alertness of the baby. If there is a hemodynamically stay unstable PDA, obviously it might uh, need treatment and the response to treatment might guide your decision. So don't rush to extubate if you're treating the PDA or planning to consider treating. This itself is a controversial topic, but I'm not going into the detail. There are multiple videos on my channel which discuss this as well. If you didn't give the caffeine pre-extubation for any reason, for example, your unit doesn't practice early caffeine, and this may be self-extubated. Uh, this is a risk because you have not given the caffeine, but you could still try non-invasive ventilation and load with caffeine in the meantime. If you are extubating from high ventilatory settings and FAO2 requirements, uh, you are being adventurous and the risk of failing is more. Uh, the way we provide the non-invasive ventilation after we extubate is very important. So inadequate support is one of the most important reasons. And one of the common reasons is failure to check the nasal patency, failure to use the right interface, failure to humidify appropriately. So all these measures are important. And the most important part here is when the tiny babies are being extubated, make sure the baby is looked after by one of your experienced nursing staff because a dedicated nurse by the bedside is crucial for successful extubation of a very small baby. Extubation failure is usually defined differently, but usually less than 72 hours after extubation, the range of uh, 24 to 7, uh, I mean, even up to 7 days. So, uh, if there is extubation failure, there are a few associated risks from that, not the risk for the extubation failure, but a risk from the extubation failure. So, there is a hemodynamic, hemodynamic compromise from the worsening ventilation, the baby may collapse, so you may have hypotension, you may have bradycardia, and uh, the reintubation efforts also may cause hemodynamic disturbance in these tiny babies. As I mentioned, there is a risk of losing lung volume and atelectrotrauma. Uh, you need higher pressures, you need to recruit the lung. So uh, there is increased risk of IVH in the extreme premature babies, both because of this hemodynamic instability as well as the high uh, carbon dioxide that's often seen. So the hypercapnia causes vasodilation, which increases the risk of uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. 
And uh, I mentioned that when the baby gets reintubated, you need higher pressures, higher support, and this increases the risk of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So it's very important to exercise caution in the extreme premature babies, 25 weeks and below. The 22, 23 weekers, many units leave them intubated for uh, up to th 29 to 30 weeks. The Iowa unit says 31 weeks. But the 24, 25 weekers, I would not extubate at least for the first four to five days when the risk of uh, PDA coming up and uh, the risk of failure of extubation is high. The IVH risk is also high in the first week. So wait for five to seven days in the 24, 25 weekers unless there is a real reason to extubate them. If there is a CO2 washout, you can always adjust the ventilatory support to balance that.